All right, good morning. I almost made it. I, would, I made it a minute late, which is not good, so um, I'll make it up to you somehow. Um, we do have attendance as normal, so please sign in. Um, I did notice that uh, probably about 10 or 11 you, of you had done a lot of the homework yesterday, so try to get ahead on that stuff. Don't wait till the weekend. Um, you should be good in, in terms of um, completing that or most of that. Um, we've covered most of that material. Um, today we are going to do a seating chart. I apologize. The boxes to fill in are quite small. They're smaller on one sheet than the other. Not sure why. Um, but please print your name and try to make it as legible as possible so that I know who you are. So you are sitting about right in here and pass that around and let's see you are right there okay um, office hours right after class if you have time I'd be happy to help you out with any homework or quizzes and I guess that's about it for the announcements see if I can get to the best part of the day. Um, we're gonna start talking about temperature scales in just a little bit. So this one might make more sense after we define temperature a little bit more. I've recently decided to freeze myself to negative 273 Celsius. My family thinks I'll die. But I think I'll be okay? Or is that Zero K, zero Kelvin. Oh, that's almost funny. Uh, see, you never knew that chemistry, science, humor could be so much fun. All right. All right, are there any questions before we get started? Um, I wanted to remind you, I know most of you have been doing a pretty good job about wearing masks. We always do have extra masks down here at the front, so if you um, need a mask, please um, come get one. Um, I should also say I've been wearing a face shield, which really doesn't do me any good. It does prevent me from spraying on you. So I should probably ask, are you guys comfortable with that? Because I can wear a, a face mask as well. <laughs> I'm going to come stand right next to you. No, I'll, st I'll stay up here. Okay, all right. So I think it's kind of important uh, that you can see me, you know, and see my expressions. Maybe you don't want to see me. Um, I don't know, but uh, it just seems odd for me to teach without being able to express myself. So, but let me know if you're not comfortable with me not wearing a face mask. Let me know, and I will wear one as well as. Uh, well, I guess if I'm wearing a face mask, I won't need the sh face shield. Okay, I'm going to try to get, sometimes you know when you're, you're rushing around, I was rushing around this morning and my adrenaline got going a little bit and I haven't quite calmed down yet, so let's see if I can settle down here. Um, we will wrap up chapter two today. We're going to do a little bit more with sig figs, unit conversions. We're going to talk about the temperature scales we're going to use in this course. And then we will get started on chapter three. We will get started on chapter three. And that, we actually get back into more chemistry stuff. We'll start talking about atomic structure, protons, neutrons, electrons, um, how those were discovered, things like that, okay? So this is where we left off. Um, density, in a lot of ways, I mean, is important to us, of course, but it's also a unit conversion type problem. So it was good to practice that yesterday. I'll let me get this going here. Oh, okay, come on. Okay, just to give you a feel of different densities of substances, solids and liquids tend to have relatively similar densities. Um, solids tend to be a little bit more dense than liquids, but they're in the same ballpark, okay? And again, it's always a good idea to know that the density of water is about one as a reference point. 
Again, that does vary with temperature and pressure, but it's a good starting point. And then you can see various um, metals in terms of their density. And then I did mention yesterday, <clears throat> gases are much less dense than liquids or solids, about a thousand times less dense. Okay, so try to picture that in terms of gas particles moving about. The space between them is very large compared to the space between the atoms or molecules that make up that liquid or solid. All right, so that is water. It's not labeled, but it does give you the density, so we'll assume that's water. And there's a, um, a solid with a density of 0.4 grams per milliliter. And there's a, well, a solid that has a higher density than water, and that should not surprise you, okay? Now, one thing that is surprising is that generally solids are more dense than the liquids they come from. That is generally the case. Solids are more dense than the liquids they come from. Ice is an exception. Okay, the structure of ice is very open. There's a lot of pores through the way the water molecules come together in kind of a hexagonal arrangement, and ice happens to be less dense than liquid water, and it floats on water, as you know. So, but these are obviously different substances. All right, I'm not gonna do this example, but I wanted to um, show you this. So you might wanna try to work this one. This is just another density problem, but you're getting at volume in a different way, and you're getting at volume um, by cubic volume, okay, by taking the length times the width, width times height of that, um, well, it's actually a rectangular cube, but a cubic substance. Um, so in this case, to get the volume, you just have to take length times width times height, three times two times one, and I'll just go through this very quickly. Okay. And we end up with cubic centimeters in this case. And as you know, that's equivalent to a milliliter. One cubic centimeter is one milliliter. So that's our volume that that cube would hold and then we can quickly calculate the density mass per volume. Okay. So generally realize when we're in the laboratory, we're going to measure out the volume. You know, whether we use a graduated cylinder or something like that, but this is another way, depending on the shape of the substance, that we could get at volume. Okay, any questions on that one? I went through that pretty quickly, but it's not too different than what we worked yesterday, except how we get at volume. Good? All right. Oh, there was another question here that I kind of skipped over. Will it float? And water, no, because it is more dense than water. Okay. All right, so this is the last part of chapter two. Um, temperature is important to us. Um, as we see with liquids, the density will vary based on temperature. We heat up that liquid, the volume of that liquid will expand, and hence the, vol the density, the volume will change, and then the density will change. Um, also, in terms of reactivity, Generally, as we raise the temperature, things become more reactive, okay? So temperature will be important. Now you'll note the Fahrenheit scale here on the left with the freezing point and boiling point of water and absolute zero, and then the Celsius scale, all right? We will not use the Fahrenheit scale in this course, and I'm not even gonna really make you do any conversion. I'm gonna show you the equations just so you know and kind of show you a shortcut, but we're gonna use Celsius and we're gonna use Kelvin, okay? So make sure you know, and the Celsius scale's nice and easy. Zero Celsius is freezing point of water. 100 Celsius is boiling point of water. Obviously 100 degrees between those. Um, 
And you'll notice absolute zero, negative 273 Celsius. So make a note of that. Um, that is the point at which if we had a perfect crystalline solid, perfectly crystalline solid, all motion would cease. Okay. Now again, picture in your mind, I want you to think about atomic motion. You know, in a solid, we kind of think that nothing is happening. But there is still motion, there's vibration, there's, thing, there's atoms moving. Okay. That would not cease to happen until we get to negative 273 Celsius, absolute zero in temperature. All right. So here are the equations to convert between Fahrenheit and Celsius. Okay. I'm not going to make you do this on a test because we're not going to use Fahrenheit. I'm just not. Um, but let me show you a quick way, you know, that you can do a little mental math. Um, so say you're driving by some bank or something. It used to always be that banks had temperature on their signs. Um, but say you see something like, oops, that didn't work. I guess I need a pen. I don't know what color I got. Oh, there we go, that works. Say you see 20 degrees Celsius on some sign somewhere, okay? Well, what temperature is, we, we here, here in the US, we still tend to think in Fahrenheit, right? Am I not the only one? I still think in Fahrenheit, right? So, but we can convert very quickly to Fahrenheit if we have Celsius. You'll notice in this conversion here, nine-fifths is 1.8. Okay, that's almost two. Okay, so instead of trying in our mind to multiply, and this again, this is an estimate, but it's a good estimate, pretty good estimate. Instead of multiplying by 1.8, multiply by two. It's easier. And then since we multiply by a little bigger factor, we do need to make up for that 32 degrees difference between the, the freezing point of water on the Celsius and Fahrenheit scale. But we multiplied by a little bit more than 1.8, so let's just add 30 instead of 32. Okay, so that's, I think, a quick, easy estimate of going from Celsius, we multiply by 2 instead of 1.8, and then we add 30. That's easy to do in our heads. Okay, 2 times 20 is 40, plus 30 is 70, 70 Fahrenheit. Okay. And if you do that for temperatures that, you know, are kind of between zero Celsius and maybe, you know, 35 to 40 Celsius, that works pretty well. As you get larger and larger temperatures or um, negative Celsius, larger and larger negative Celsius temperatures, I guess it'd be smaller, um, then you'll get more deviation. But it's a good quick estimate, okay? And you could go the other way if you wanted. You could subtract 30 from Fahrenheit and divide by two if you wanted to go from Fahrenheit to Celsius. Get you pretty close. But we don't need to do that. That's just for our own knowledge, okay? Because we are going to focus on Celsius and Kelvin. And we will use Kelvin more often than Celsius, but we will use both of those, okay? Now, the nice thing about the Kelvin temperature scale, as you saw in the joke at the start, right? Um, zero Kelvin is absolute zero. That kind of makes sense, doesn't it? Um, so zero Kelvin, absolute zero in temperature. So in effect, we're just adding 273 to our degree Celsius, okay? So if we wanted to write Just a quick conversion between those. And that's a lot easier, isn't it? We just have to take Celsius and add 273. And so we see for the freezing point of water, zero Celsius, add 273, 273 Kelvin. Boiling point, 100 Celsius, 
add 273, 373 Kelvin. Okay. So again, in science, in chemistry, we will just use those two temperature scales, Celsius and Kelvin. Any questions? Okay, so get used to those. If you're not used to Celsius and Kelvin very much, um, we don't need stinking Fahrenheit. All right. Oh, and one thing to point out, you may know from past courses or whatnot, it's actually 273.15. Has anybody ever seen the 273.15? Um, or actually for Celsius, negative 273.15 would be absolute zero. For our purposes, 273 for the math that we're going to do is going to be close enough. If you want to use 273.15, um, go ahead. It, does, it won't matter. Okay. Yeah, so here you see the 273.15. Don't worry about Fahrenheit. We don't need to do this calculation. All right. Wow, those are kind of small. Let's let's see let's see if I can make this a little bit. All right. All right, that's not too bad. So I believe it was you asked about kind of these mixed sig fig calculations yesterday. Is that correct? Okay. So I thought we would just, to wrap up this chapter, we would do one more thing with sig figs, and we'll do one more unit conversion. Okay, so you don't have these in your notes. Don't worry about writing that whole big paragraph down. We'll talk through that in just a minute. But try to do the calculation at the top and express that to the correct number of significant figures. Okay? And remember, the rules for multiplication are different than the rules for addition and subtraction. So do the multiplication first. In your mind, make sure you know how many sig figs you should have. And then do the subtraction. So take a minute here and see what you get. There should be a different one on this side of the room than on this side. Got it? Cool. How about the attendance sheet? Does that make it all the way around? Oh, you guys are good. Thank you. All right, so how are we doing on this first one? Okay. Just punching numbers in our calculator, but we do need to express this, assuming these are measurements we take in the lab, we need to express this the correct digits. Um, I've carried more than I need in that first multiplication. Okay, so if I punch those in my calculator, I get about 105.41. How many significant digits should that number have? Just three. Okay. But the, the common rule, and I think we talked about this yesterday, is you keep the numbers in your calculator and you round the correct number at the end if it's multi-step. But we want to make a note that our last significant digit is that five. Okay, so 105. Now we subtract, and what is the rule for subtraction? Okay, the fewest digits after the decimal point. 
Well, 105 doesn't have any digits after the decimal point. And 40.25 has two. So how many do we carry in our answer? Yeah, we don't carry any digits after the decimal point in our answer. So I'm going to keep that 105.41, whatever it is, in my calculator, and now subtract 40.25. And I'll write out more digits, but I end up with 65.16. But because this number, and I will write it again, was 105 with no digits after our decimal point, we can't carry any digits after the decimal point in our answer. And this becomes 65. Does that seem kind of odd? You know, we start with three sig figs for our first two numbers. We have four in our third number, but yet our answer ends up with two. And that can happen depending on when you're mixing these operations together and in terms of the rules for decimal places and whatnot. Does it make sense? No. Who said no? Oh, hi. I think I just lost there for a second. Can you just explain the last step one more time how we have to do this? Okay. Yeah, don't worry about the two, worry about the decimal point. Okay. So the first calculation, the multiplication. Um, even though it comes out to 105.41, we only have three sig figs. So really that's 105, okay? And 105 doesn't have any digits after the decimal point if we write it as 105 with three sig figs, right? So now we do the subtraction and it's based on we carry the fewest digits after the decimal point in our answer, okay? And so that's why we end up with 65 with no digits after, just like 105 didn't have any. It might help if I actually wrote it like this, if I wrote. Okay, and so we see 105 without any digits after, so we don't carry any digits after in our answer. Now, but you should keep the full number in your calculator and then round at the end, okay? I don't think it'll make a difference in your answer in this case if you round it at each step, but you generally don't want to round at each step. Okay, and then let's say that it was 65, you would round up, okay? So 0.5 or larger, round up. Yes? Yes. Oh, okay, thank you. Yes. Okay. Other questions? Those are kind of confusing. I'll admit it, because you have to know both rules, and then you have to make sure you keep track of your significant digits along the way. Yes. Is addition the same here? Addition is the same as subtraction. So multi multiplication division is just based on the fewest number of sig figs in any number. Addition and subtraction is based on the decimal point. Okay, thank you. Okay. Anything else before we move on? Yes. So you're saying it's best to just keep the original number in your calculator when you're doing calculations? Yes. Also keep in mind that you have the significance of the Okay, yeah. so that was not just on the whole slide, but I think like the practice thing that you had us do was saying to not round until the very end. So right. it's confusing. Okay, yeah, I think I'm saying this because I kept the 105.41 in my calculator, even though I knew it's just 105, and that's just to keep track of your sig figs, and then you round at the end. Does that make sense? Okay. You know, for most, I would say, for a lot of the calculations we do, if you round at each step, you'll probably be fine but you can introduce errors if you round at each step of a multi-step calculation. Okay? All right, are we good with this one before we move on? All right, lots of good questions, but hopefully that cleared up some stuff. All right, let me zoom out a little bit here if I can find my 
cursor. All right, that's a little bit small, but let me um, read this if you can't see it from the back. Um, I found this, oh, I don't know if I found this a couple years ago, but Elon Musk put this thing out that, you know, we could power the entire U.S. with solar, which actually is not true because we don't have solar all day long, um, but just by putting solar panels in Northwest Texas. You know, what good is Northwest Texas anyway? Might as well cover it in solar panels. Sorry if you're from Northwest Texas. Um, that was, I was trying to be funny. Um, so, the U.S. uses about 425 gigawatts of electricity per year, and this is from a couple of years ago. Um, average solar panels in Northwest Texas based on the amount of sunlight per day over the course of the year um, would produce about 0 0.0504 gigawatts per kilometer squared of surface area. Okay. Um, and that's per year. Calculate how much surface area of solar panels in miles squared, because we're, you know, we're in the US, we use miles, we don't use kilometers, right? Um, I could go back to my childhood when I was in third grade and there was a big push in the US to switch to the metric system and it did not go well. I remember in third grade, we were learning centimeters and kilometers and even at that time, they started building cars that you had both, which they still do, miles and kilometers on the speedometer. Before that, they did not. We just had miles per hour. We didn't have kilometers per hour on the speedometers. See, back in the day. Um, so how, how much would we have, how much of Northwest Texas in miles squared would we have to cover to power, theoretically, power the US, okay? We can't, do, we can't do that because one, you have to distribute the power. That's not, you know, that would be hard to distribute it from one location. And without having solar at night, it kind of would not, we'd have to find some way to store that energy generated during the day to be able to use some of that at night. But it's a good thought exercise. All right, so let's see if we can do this calculation. So there's, as you'll find with word problems like this, there's a lot of stuff there, okay? There's a lot of words, there's a lot of things going on. So we need to pick out some stuff, okay? So one thing that I notice is 425. That's the total amount of power we need to generate for the year to power the United States, okay? And what do we wanna to get to? Yeah, we want to get to miles squared of solar panels. So we're starting with power production, energy production, and we need to get to surface area. So what conversion factor allows me to link between the energy need, that gigawatts, and surface area? Is there a conversion factor that'll allow me to get there? Yes. Okay, so you'll notice um, you're given information, 0 0.0504 gigawatts per kilometer squared. It's actually written twice. Oops. Okay, so we pick that out of all those words that are there. So that will allow us to get to kilometers squared, I think. And then once we get to kilometers squared, we should be able to get to miles squared, okay? So this, when you first read this, you go, oh man, there's a lot of stuff there, but it's really not that bad once you start picking out information. Because if I can go, kilometers squared per gigawatt, and that information is given right in the problem, and then you're also given the conversion from my, miles to kilometers, so once we have that, we should be able to convert that kilometer squared to mile squared. Okay? Yes? Why did you give us gigawatt to watch? Just to let you know what a gigawatt was. And, and the, the other reason is sometimes there's information in a problem you don't need. 
You actually don't need that, but if you didn't know what giga was, giga is just a billion. So 425 gigawatts is 425 billion watts of electricity for the year. Okay. So realize that sometimes in problems there will be information that is not needed to solve the problem. All right, so we plug in. See, I'm, I'm hoping some of you are working ahead of me here, seeing if you can get this answer. Check your units, gigawatts divided by gigawatts. That's just one. And then miles to kilometers, one mile, 1.609 kilometers. Is that the conversion factor I need? No. What do I need? Okay, so we could write this conversion factor a second time if we wanted to, or we can just put that in parentheses and, and square it. Now when you do that, don't forget to square the numbers. It squares the units and it squares the numbers. So this is obviously kilometers squared, so that will cancel with that, and we end up with miles squared. So when we punch this into our calculators, we're going to go 425 divided by 0 0.0504, and then we're going to divide by 1.609 squared. Okay, so let's do that. So 425 divided by 0 0.0504 divided by 1.609. And there should be a squared key on here, I think. There it is. It's right below your caret key if you're using the same calculator I am. And what, what do you guys get? I want to maybe, hope I did not sure I punched this in right. The 3,200? Let me try this again. Okay. So 3,257. And how many sig figs do we have? Three. Okay. So in terms of the correct sig fig, so this is 3,257. And my pen is not writing there for some reason. Interesting. Oh, there it goes. Huh. <laughs> I've got to find where my pen w it will decide that it's going to write. Oh. Technology, it's wonderful. Okay. Let me try this here. I don't know what's going on. All right, try this again. There we go. Okay, now. So to three sig figs, we really need to use scientific notation. 3.26, we would round, because this is a seven, we would round that up to six. Okay, so essentially 3260 for our answer. Okay, now take the square root of that, and that will give us the miles on each side. So if you take hit the square root key on your calculator, which is a second function above the x squared, at least on this one. Get about 57.1 miles. Okay, so if you take the square root of this, so if we built a solar field, 57 miles on each side, that could power the U.S. 
theoretically. It's a good thought exercise. It's kind of fun. So, I mean, it, it's really, if you think about that, six, six, roughly 60 miles in square in each, you know, 60 miles square would provide enough power theoretically to power the United States. Was there a question somewhere? Yes. Oh. Right. There are actually no exact ones in here. We start with 425, so that's three. You're given this number. You would assume that's not exact in terms of what, you know, a kilometer squared of solar panels could generate. So that has three sig figs, five, zero, and four. Okay, that's a captive zero, so that counts. Leading zeros do not, so that's three. And then this has, we probably could express this one to more, but at least given the problem, it had four, which is more than our other two numbers, so that's fine. Okay. All right, other questions before we move on? Is that kind of fun? No? <laughs> It's kind of, you know, I mean, you look at problems like that, and you might not be interested in that, but it's kind of, it's kind of fun sometimes to do little thought experiments. And clearly, Elon Musk was doing this, that here. You know, he knows that this is not reality, but it does kind of open your mind and go, is that really all we need? 60 square miles, you know, 60 uh, square, that's, well, 3,260 square miles, but 60 miles on each side. That's it? I mean, it doesn't seem like very much to me, but again, there's a lot that, that's, again, only theoretical, but it's kind of fun. Gosh, that'll wake you up. All right, that is chapter two. So we are moving right along just to, um, the first chapter was very quick, okay? This chapter, chapter two, is mostly math, okay? Um, we will do a lot more than math in this course, but we have to at least lay the ground rules, so that's done. So let's actually get back into some chemistry. Um, again, make sure you realize that the notes are, at least partially, partial notes are posted for you in Achieve, if you'd like to use those. Um, I did add a few more of um, kind of more informational slides in here yesterday that you won't have, but it's more just to kind of give you some more background information. Okay, so let's go back to our... All right, so clearly, um, no matter what we're looking at, everything's made of atoms and molecules, okay? And this concept of an atom, okay, which for a long time was defined as the smallest indivisible particle of matter, goes way back, okay, way back in time to this guy, okay? So Democritus, um, you know, that's what, 2,500 years ago was really the first to propose the concept of an atom, okay? Now he was Greek and he called them atomos, um, so that's where we get um, the term atom, but in, that means indivisible, so smallest indivisible particle of matter, okay? And that concept of the atom didn't go anywhere for a very long time, okay? So that was 2,500 years ago. And then the concept of the atom, you know, science kind of floundered for a long time and we had alchemy and all sorts of other stuff. And it really wasn't until the 1700s that this whole concept of the atom came back, um, at least in, you know, kind of Western science. So here's one guy you've probably never heard of, Pierre Gassendi. And this is, I, I added this in, because I find this stuff really interesting. So you don't have to write this stuff down. This is just to kind of say, this is pretty cool stuff, okay? So one of the reasons um, that the concept of the atom went away was because of um, Aristotle, 
Okay, you've heard of Aristotle, right? He didn't believe in the atom. He believed in the four elements. Does everybody know the four elements that make up everything? At least according to Aristotle, and I believe Plato as well. Earth, fire, air, and water. Yes, you got it. So they said earth, fire, air, water makes up everything. Okay? And that really was the dominant philosophy for a long time. Okay? And then the other issue was uh, that for whatever reason, it didn't coincide, the concept of the atom did not coincide with religion. Go figure. Um, so in Paris, you could be killed for um, opposing Aristotle. Okay, so you couldn't talk about atoms because that went against that philosophy. So weird stuff. Um, but even with this decree, this decree in place, there were some brave scientists out there, including Gassendi. Um, so just to show you kind of a cool experiment here, um, he was a priest, which I guess helped him because to kind of to get that religion science thing to work out a little bit. Um, he was able to revive the concept of the atom and reconcile with Christianity. Um, and he was one of the first, I guess maybe the first, to propose this concept of a molecule. Okay, so we have these smallest indivisible particles of matter, and they can come together to form a molecule. So that's pretty cool. This scary looking guy, um, Daniel Sennert. Let you take a look at that for a second. Um, he let, went a little bit further. Um, he proposed, you know, that they knew about some elements, but the simplest atoms were those of the elements, um, and that anything that is not an atom is bonded atoms together. So again, he's talking, he went beyond, and he talked about bonding atoms together. Um, he did some really cool experiments to kind of show the existence of atoms. Um, he showed that atoms must be really small. So had some wine, put um, four layers of paper on top of that wine, and it penetrated the layers of paper, which must mean that the atoms are small enough to get through all the pores of the paper, um, even through four layers. So atoms must be very small. And then this one's really cool because he took um, a mixture of gold and silver. Silver dissolves in nitric acid, gold does not. And then he was able to separate those two components of the mixture. Okay, And he essentially was saying that atoms of one element are different from atoms of an other element. Okay? And this is going way back. This is back in the um, you know, late 1500s, early 1600s that he is proposing silver atoms are different than gold atoms, and we can separate them. And one more, just to kind of show you some of the early days that the, this one, this guy was mentioned in your book, uh, Lavoisier. Um, he is kind of considered the father of modern chemistry. Um, his career was cut short. Does anybody know the story about Lavoisier? He, he was from France. He also, I guess, had a job as a tax collector of some sort. And during the French Revolution, that did not go over very well. And he was guillotined. So, so the father of modern chemistry um, didn't make it through the French Revolution. But he was the scientist that came up with something we still, you know, a very fundamental part of chemistry, the law of conservation of mass. OK, 
Okay, mass is conserved, matter is neither created nor destroyed. So this isn't a chemical reaction. Even though we're changing how atoms are bonded together, we're not creating new types of atoms, we're not destroying atoms. Okay, mass is conserved. Okay, and we did a little bit in chapter one about laws and theories. Um, he actually took the work of a number of different other scientists and he combined them, divine the observations and experiments into one overarching law. And it's a law that still holds to this day. Okay. So as you're looking through the textbook, oh, I should probably say, oh, I haven't, we haven't done a pre-lecture. Should we do a pre-lecture for tomorrow? No? For chapter three? Okay, um, I will post one right after class and I will send you an email. Okay, I know email is kind of antiquated these days, but let's do a little pre-lecture on chapter three. We have a few minutes left. Um, this is in chapter three, um, not this particular slide. I like this slide better than the one that was with the book, but there's one in the book that's very similar to this. Um, I chose this one because this is what I, I think is so cool about chemical reactions. If we take sodium, Sodium is a very soft metal that you can cut with a butter knife, okay? It's a highly reactive metal and very reactive with water, even with oxygen and air. We combine that with chlorine gas, which is a toxic green gas, okay? They react quite vigorously together and what do we get? Salt, something we eat. You would not want to put sodium in your mouth. It would react with your saliva and it would not be a good thing. Um, you would not want to spend any time in an environment of chlorine gas, that would kill you, okay? But when we change how they are combined, we still have sodium and chlorine, but we change how they're combined, we get something that we can eat. I always think that's kind of cool. Last thing for today, note the mass. You know, if we have, and these are just, you know, it's pro these are probably the correct ratio in terms of mass of how they actually combine, but 7.7 .7 grams of sodium, 11.9 grams of chlorine, that's the total mass of our reactants. Even though we get a different product because we've changed how those atoms are bonded, we're gonna have the same mass of product. That is the law of conservation of mass. Matter is not created nor destroyed. Mass is conserved, okay? Our atoms are not created or destroyed. Okay, that's it for today. Um, we will, I'll do a very short pre-lecture on chapter three for tomorrow. I'll look at where we're gonna to get to tomorrow in that chapter. So look for that. Just be a couple of questions to answer, maybe a, uh, section of the book to take a look at, and I'll see you tomorrow. You're welcome. Um, if you have any questions, please come on down a few minutes. Oh, thank you for the seating chart. Thanks for doing that, guys. If you ever forget where you are seated, come on down. I'll bring this to class, and you can, you should know where your where your where, you, where your seat is. Hi. Oops.